Hello, everyone. Welcome to 2022 uh, first semester lecture series. Uh, I think we can start uh, one minute later at 12 for Korean time. And I would introduce our today's lecturer. In between that, I would like to uh, uh, recommend everyone that if you have any questions or comments in between the lecture, please uh, freely uh, give us uh, some comments or, or questions in the chat, then we can see that in after the lecture or in between the lectures. So I would like to recommend everyone to more participate in the lecture series. So, and welcome all. So, okay, for today, on behalf of Professor Dong Lee, our organizer of this teen lecture series, I'd like to introduce our lecturer, Dr. Soyoung Kang. Dr. Kang is currently the professor in the Department of Nuclear Medicine, the Yihua Women's University Seoul Hospital. And Dr. Kang has accumulated outstanding achievements in the research of oncology nuclear medicine and molecular imaging and especially she has dedicated for the research of tumor glucose metabolism in her doctoral degree so i think uh, which is related to today's lecture so today Dr. professor kang will deliver us a lecture named as a glucose metabolism in tumor so please welcome dr soyoung kang uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Soyeon Kang, a nuclear medicine physician. Yeah, at first, I'm very thank you uh, for introducing <laughs> very well. So, yeah, I'm today I'm talking about tumor glucose metabolism. So let's start. Uh, yeah, before yeah starting the, I'd like to say the. Uh, I'd like to talk about the FDS plus CD. Yeah, actually, yeah, these days many kinds of new patras, new pet tracers are developing, such as PSMA. But FDC, I think FDC is a major part of the crown medicine field. Uh, so I think it is very important to understand tumor glucose metabolism to interpret it at least past city more precisely. So yeah, actually this figure is very familiar with you. Yeah, we use uh, deoxyfluoridated glucose as a tracer. It can enter into the cells using glucose transporter because it is an analog of glucose. In the cell, it is phosphorated with hexokinase and that it is trapped in the cell because it can go to anyone. Anyway, this uh, accumulation of FTG uh, make uh, us uh, make us uh, evaluating cancer diagnosis in the cancer cell diagnosis in the cancer patient. But uh, we need to uh, think about this process. So why? Uh, it is possible for evaluating uh, high glycolytic status in cancer patient because yeah because cancer uh, cancer love glucose yeah that is true so it is very specific glucose metabolic pathway in cancer uh, that is aerobic glycolysis so now you should remember the term aerobic glycolysis. So today, uh, I'd like to say uh, verbal effect. Actually, it is a nickname of aerobic glycolysis. So in this part, uh, we are focusing in the private kinase M2. And also, I, I will introduce the new path tracer for targeting private kinase M2. The name is DASA23. And in the second part, I um, talk about the glycolysis induced drug resistance. 
Actually, in this part, we are discussing about glycolysis targeting therapy and lactate metabolism and also metabolic plasticity of tumor cells. Yeah, so part one, verbal effect. Yeah, before understanding verbal effect, uh, we first uh, remember, uh, we should remember the glycolysis pathway. We have already learned the glycolysis pathway in the biochemistry class. Yeah, maybe I think, uh, yeah, I think you may remember the class, but uh, let's review it. So in the glycolysis pathway, glucose uh, phosphorylated using several kind of enzymes. And finally, uh, glucose converts to pyruvate, and then it converts to acetyl-CoA, and then it goes to the uh, mitochondria for uh, oxidative phosphorylation uh, through cyclic acid cycle. So it is normal glycolysis pathway. However, in the cancer, it is a little bit different. So it is LV glycolysis. It's a hallmark of cancer cell glucose metabolism. It LV glycolysis means the shift toward lactate production in cancers, even in the presence of adequate oxygen. So in the differentiated tissue, uh, probably uh, most of the normal tissue in our body, uh, they use uh, this glucose metabolic pathway using oxidative phosphorylation in the mitochondria. However, if uh, the cell run out of oxygen and then they uh, go to the lactate fermentation pathway, so this uh, glucose pathway, glycolytic -like pathway in the different differentiated tissue highly depends on oxygen level. However, uh, it is uh, different in the cancer cells. So 19 Chinese uh, Weibrook observed that cancer cells had a distinct metabolism that was highly dependent on glycolysis instead of mitochondria oxidative phosphorylation, even regardless of oxygen availability. Uh, at that time, um, many scientists and Warburg would thought that this effect was a consequence of damage to the mitochondria or an um, adaptation to hypoxic conditions during the early avascular phase of tumor development. However, current insights we build our glycolysis supports various biosynthetic pathways and uh, consequently the metabolic requirements for tumor proliferation. So yeah, the metabolism of glucose to lactate generate only two or maximum four ATPs per molecule of glucose, whereas oxidative phosphorations of uh, yeah, generate up to 36 ATPs upon complete oxidation of one glucose molecule. So this raises this raises the question why a least efficient process, at least in terms of ATP production, would be selected for in proliferating tissue, especially cancer. A possible explanation for the switch to aerobic glycolysis is that uh, proliferating cells have important metabolic requirements that extend beyond ATP. Because the tumor need more building blocks for consisti consisting of their bodies, uh, that means their cytosol and uh, repeat by layer membranes. So yeah, it is very useful pathway for uh, proliferating tumor cells. So in this pathway, very key enzyme is pyruvic kinase. Pyruvic kinases are consisting of four isoforms, pyruvic kinase M1, 
arcanism 2 and L and R. So they are differentially ex expressed depending on several tissues. So pelvic kinase M1 uh, is expressed in brain and muscle, and M2 pelvic kinase is expressed in um, proliferating cells such as embryonic cells and stem cells and also tumor cells. And L type pelvic kinase is expressed in liver, kidney, and intestine. And R type pelvic kinase is expressed in erythrocytes. So these isoforms are similar in the function of kinase activity to convert a uh, pelvate from phosphatidylphosphatidylphosphatidylphosphatidylphosphatidylphosphatidylphosphatidylphosphatidylphosphatidylphosphatidylphosphatidylphosphatidylphosphatidylphosphatidylphosphatidylphosphatidylphosphat
uh, not only ATP, but also many biosynthetic molecules for proliferation. So yeah, this is the reason why the cancer cells uh, choose the LRP-glytic pathway. So yeah, back to, to the pyruvate kinase M2. Uh, yeah, this is a little bit complicated figure, but this figure uh, shows very well the roles of pyruvate kinase M2 in cytosols and also nucleus. So yeah, here, here is tetramer form of pyruvate kinase M2. So it converts uh, phosphoenyl pyruvate to pyruvate. So yeah, they act like kinase. However, uh, with tyrosine phosphorylation, they uh, convert to the pyruvate kinase M2 dimer form, and then they lose their kinase function. And also with the starting phosphorylation, they can enter into the nucleus. In the nucleus, they act like a transcription factor. So they control or regulation or gene expression level of several glycolytic enzymes and also PKM to itself and also several enzymes related to tumor proliferation. So yeah, dimeric form of PKM2 help tumor uh, proliferation and survival. So you can understand now, pyruvate kinase M2 has two functions. One is glycolytic function control uh, to pro control and produce the pyruvate. And the other function is non-glycolytic function. And, they, and that is the uh, transcription factor for promoting the cancer cells. So, this pyruvate kinase, uh, uh, the dimeric form of pyruvate kinase M2 is highly uh, related to tumor aggressiveness and uh, uh, proliferation because of these characteristics. So I'd like to introduce uh, some examples showing pyruvate kinase M2 levels in the cell. Actually, uh, yeah, this is my data. So this cell lines is triple negative breast cancer cells, MD, MB231. So this cell lines is very famous for their aggressiveness and usually the patient with TMBC has poor prognosis. So here, uh, blue signal is adaptive uh, staining for nucleus and the green signal means pyruvate kinase M2. And red signal is just a specific for uh, the cell line, not the cell line, just it uh, made by uh, my experiment, so just uh, ignore this signal. Anyway, yeah, you can see here in the side to do, yeah, you can see here very uh, diffuse, pyruvate kinase M2 signals in the cytosol except nucleus. Maybe you can separate the signal in the cytosol except for nucleus. However, uh, with the staining phosphorylated pyruvate kinase M2, actually I stained this cell with uh, serine tyrosine, uh, serine phosphorylated pyruvate kinase M2 antibody. So it means um, in the previous slide, in the cell phosphorylated pyruvate kinase M2 uh, can enter into the nucleus. So, yeah, in this cell shows the signal in the located uh, not only cytosol and but also nucleus. Yeah, you maybe you can uh, see the difference between PKM2 and phosphorylated PKM2. However, in this pattern uh, was highly different in the, the other breast cancer cells. So this is a lumina type breast cancer cell, and step 7 So yeah, it, although it is also kind of a breast cancer cell, but it is uh, 
relatively less uh, aggressive and also relatively the, pa the patient with rheumatoid breast cancer um, show good prognosis compared to TMBC. So here, yeah, same with the previous one, the P staining blue one and green signal means uh, here is glucose transporter and here is pyruvate kinase M2, here is phosphorylated phosphorylated pyruvate kinase M2. So yeah, uh, still you can observe the green signal in the cytosol. So that means the this cancer cell also produce an expression of uh, pyruvate kinase M2. However, uh, in the same way, the phosphorylated pyruvate kinase M2, we can find the, the signal. So it was, I think it was, it is so interesting because the two are breast cancer cell, however, but they showed very big difference in the phosphor, phosphorylation level of uh, pyruvate, uh, pyruvate kinase M2 phosphorylation. However, uh, activation with some stimulation of these cell lines, uh, the level of phosphorylated pyruvate kinase M2 was dramatically changing. Yeah, it was dramatically changed. So now you can see the signal of phosphorylated pyruvate kinase M2 in the nucleus and also cytogen. So that means the phosphorylated pyruvate kinase M2 is highly dependent with the tumor aggressiveness and proliferation. So yeah, based on these several information, yeah, they are several clinical studies uh, for evaluating relationship between pyruvate kinase M2 expression and prognosis. So from this meta-analysis, uh, they reported uh, higher levels of PKM2 was significantly associated with poor prognosis. So this is the list of studies involved in this meta-analysis. And among them, um, I, I will introduce one uh, report uh, using lung adenocarcinoma. Yeah, actually, as you expected, the result showed that the PKM2 expression level was highly related to over survivor and also disease-free survival in lung cancer patient. And also the SUV max level, SUV max level was also highly related to PKM2 expression level. And the figure B showed and the, yes, the correlation between acid max and PKM2 expression. But I think it, the relationship is not so high. Yeah, I mean, the, yeah, maybe, yeah, it, the correlation coefficient is not, uh, high, not so high. They just show the moderated, moderated relationship between acid max and PKM2 expression. I think the reason why this uh, moderate relationship between acid max and PKM2 expression is because uh, the researchers did not compare the relationship between acid max and phosphorylation level of PKM2. Because yeah, in the previous slide, I uh, showed you the PKM2 expression is very common in the cancer cells, even less aggressive cancer cells. So they did not, the PKM2 expression does not exactly the level of the cancer expression. So if uh, the authors compare the correlation as with max and phosphorylation level of PKM2, uh, the correlation level will maybe more um, increase. Yeah, so um, 
according to many evidence of the importance of a PKM2 and also PKM2 phosphorylation, uh, people uh, start to find out uh, the activators, PKM2 activators. Uh, don't be confused the word activators. Actually, uh, I explained about the PKM2 characteristics. So yeah, tetramory form has highly uh, active in kinase function. So in this time, activator means uh, it convert pyruvate kinase M2 convert to um, tetramory form from dimory form. So uh, in this situation, PKM2 activate, activators are like uh, PKM2 inhibitors. So please uh, don't be confused the word. So actually there are many kinds of candidate for PKM2 activators, but um, these three are representative activators of PKM2. And today I uh, will focus on uh, DASA 23. PKM2 activator. So, yeah, 2015, the decrease the Gambia group uh, has have reported that the new tracer uh, C11 labeled DASA23 for evaluating the tumor drug crisis larva in cancer. So yeah, this tracer showed, uh, showed a good uptake ratio and yeah, washed out in several kind of cancer cells. And two years later, they reported an F18 labeled uh, DASA23 for imaging tumor glycolysis, especially targeting pirate kinase M2. So yeah, they showed several um, uh, became just representative structures. And yeah, this tracer also showed is good uh, trace uptake per protein and good uh, retention in the cell and also good spasticity in the cell. So yeah, I think it is very good trace for evaluating the pyruvate kinase M2 glava because actually it is a pyruvate kinase M2 activator. That means they can uh, bind a pocket at the dimeric form PKM2 subunit interface. So that means they cannot bind to the tetramory form of PKM2. So it is very important to uh, evaluate the cancer proliferation and also evaluate the prognosis of the patient. So in this report, they compared the uh, new tracer DASA23 uh, with FDG. Actually, in this study, they uh, used a glioblastoma brain tumor. So here is uptake ratio. Uh, yeah, you can see it's very uh, good uptake ratio of DASA23 compared to FDG. And also for evaluating uh, cancer treatment response, they use several kinds of cytotoxic agent. So they again compared the uh, efficacy of uh, DASA23 and FTG. So after three day treatment and six day treatment uh, in the DASA23, they showed very deep uh, differences between treatment groups. So that means it is very, it has good potential to evaluate cancer treatment response. Yeah, and also, and also in they compare to um, 
cell uptake level and the PKM2 expression in the cell. Uh, actually, in this figure, yeah, maybe you can find uh, there was not significant correlation between NASA 23 cell uptake and PKM2 uh, expression level in the tissue. Actually, it is a natural consequence. Uh, yeah, in the previous slide, I told you PKM2 expression level is not uh, the same with the uh, phosphorylation level of PKM2. So, TASA 23 actually uh, showed the phosphorylated PKM2, the dimer form. So, it is natural result. There was not so big correlation between uh, cellular uptake and uh, PKM2 expression level. Uh, so they finally, they started to uh, started clinical trial for uh, evaluating the this new tracer DASA23 in patient with intracranial tumors or recurrent glioblastoma. So yeah, these clinical trials are still ongoing. Yeah, so it is the first data for introducing, for showing the biodistribution of a, a whole body DASA23 tracers. So figure A shows uh, images at different time points post injection of DASA23 in volunteer one. Yeah, you can yeah, see, maybe you can think it is very similar with the uh, FD's path. Yeah, a little bit is similar with FD's path. However, uh, it shows very good target to background ratio after uh, one hour injection. Especially in brain, in the brain tissue, the uh, target to background ratio is uh, highly significant. Also, figure B shows images at uh, 30 minutes post injection of TASA 23 in five healthy volunteers. So, yeah, actually, it is uh, yeah, very, uh, I think it is surprising because just uh, after three minutes post injection, the images it shows very yeah good performance in the target to background ratio. Uh, you can see uh, the river because a tracer uh, metabolite in river, so yeah, it tracer accumulate in the gallbladder and biliary duct. So yeah, maybe it is hard to evaluate. Uh, this tracer in the biliary tract cancers. Yeah, anyway, uh, yeah, you can see the flowers and also kidney and yeah, urinary bladder. Uh, yeah, it is time activity curves for five healthy volunteers for organs. Yeah, brain time activity curve shows very good uh, speed or wash out in the whole brain tissues. And also, yeah, other uh, important organ uh, showed um, their uh, yeah, adequate time activity curve. And also, yeah, bone marrow sh showed also uh, yeah, very uh, adequate time activity curve evaluating bone or bone marrow, it is, I think it is a similar pattern with the whole brain. So yeah, it can be useful for evaluating uh, bone marrow infiltration of tumor, I think. So yeah, last year, uh, last December, uh, they reported a result of a clinical trial uh, of this new tracer to monitor pipette kinase and to induce glycolytic uh, reprogramming in glioblastoma. So yeah, here, yeah, you can see uh, tumor uptake in the left brain. So yeah, it shows 
yeah, very good uh, target to background ratio. And also, yeah, it shows very big difference of 80% compared with the normal brain. And in figure F, shows and another interesting things in this tracer. Uh, actually, it's not interesting. I think it is a little bit disappointing uh, because yeah, they showed the uptake level of a pirate kinase M2 tracer, that's a trans3, uh, according to cell types. So yeah, of course, yeah, here is the highly uptake in the tumor cell, but you can see also the uh, the tracer is accumulated in the microglia and then fold and my own my the cells in the brain tumor tissue. So that means it can be accumulated in the immune cells. It is because the PKM2 is also used at activated immune cells. So actually, uh, I think it is a little bit dis disappointing because inflammation is one of these advantages in evaluating cancer in this path. Uh, yeah, we cannot, uh, it is hard to evaluate uh, or differentially diagnose uh, between cancer and activated immune inflammation, but the same situation occurs in the new tracer. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, back to the result. Uh, yeah, this is the uh, yeah, result of has volunteers. And yeah, still they showed that it's very good performance in the brain tissues. They show there's very big clearance in whole brain tissue, but the white matter is more slow than the uh, other gray matter tissues uh, in the wash shot ratio. But yeah, so yeah, you can see, yeah, still accumulated tracer in the white matter after one hour of injection. So they evaluated a uh, serial DASA 23 imaging in glioblastoma patient. So they compared the, compare the efficacy of this path CD uh, with MRI and FDS path CD. So this patient have a glioblastoma in the left frontal lobe. So yeah, here is a tumor. Uh, yeah. After this past city, yeah, it is very, it is a, a little bit accumulated um, tracer trace in the tumor. However, in the DASA 23 path, yeah, you can see it's highly accumulated in tumor of the tracer. Uh, after post treatment, they performed uh, DASA. PET and also MRI again. Actually, the result between uh, DASA 23 PET and MRI um, not the same. Yeah, you can maybe see that in the MRI, the tumor volume is a little bit decreased. However, in the DASA 23 PET, it was increased. The tumor is progressed. So in the follow-up MRI, three months follow, the tumor was significantly progressive and yeah, progressive. So actually you can see here is very hot portion of PKM2 levels of tissue were developing in the progression of a tumor. So that means the uptake of in this time, the, that means uh, that reveals the viable tumor and also highly proliferative state of uh, dislocation. Anyway, after three months follow, 
uh, the patient uh, ha has got surgery mm. and yeah, it was tumor cell and it was hurry and PKM to staining showed is a uh, very diffuse pattern in all tumor tissues. So yeah, this is a summary of part one. So yeah, I think yeah, vulvar defect or yeah, aerobic crisis is a hallmark of cancer glucose metabolism. So in cancer glucose metabolic pathway, pyruvate kinase M2 is a key enzyme to uh, control weight limiting. And it is predominantly expressed in the uh, proliferating embryonic cells and tumor cells. And it PKM2 exists in two isomeric forms and highly active tetrameric and low active diamond forms. And the post-translation modification, uh, such as a phosphorylation, is PKM2 provides metabolic and non-metabolic benefits to cancer cells. And finally, um, F18-23 is a new PKM2 specific radio tracer for non-invasive visualization of PKM2 status. And so it is potential path tracer for evaluating um, brain tumor, but uh, I expect it can be useful in other solid tumor in the body. Yeah, so yeah, this is the end of part one. So uh, if you have a question or a comment, yeah, please. So uh, comparing with the FDG PET, uh, firstly, what is the optic mechanism of this DASA 23 tracer? Is it kind of like inhibitor? Oh, yeah. Actually, I told you it is activator. <laughs> yeah. Ah, sorry. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, uh, yeah. Maybe yeah, many pay, many uh, people uh, may confuse the uh, activator and inhibitor, but actually it is pyruvate kinase M2 activators because uh, because it uh, pyruvate kinase M2's characteristics. I mean, uh, yeah, here, yeah, actually. Uh, in the tetrameric form, it has a high kinase activity. So in that case, it is not highly uh, oncogenic or highly um, related to cancer aggressiveness. However, in the dimeric form with low kinase activity, it is highly oncogenic and highly related to cancer proliferation and aggressiveness. So PKM2 activator means it uh, convert to tetrameric form from dimeric form. So it is a little bit different with other kinase inhibitors. So yeah, please don't be confused the word activators and inhibitors. Yeah, actually, but yeah, that's a 23, it's um, activator. So then is it, uh... The DASA is it, it related with the uh, PKM to post or so yeah, what right. I want to? Yeah, yeah, that's uh, right. Yeah, that, I, I think that is very good point. Yeah, actually, I emphasized several times we should uh, evaluate in phosphorylation level of PKM to not PKM to expression. However, DASA twenty three. Uh, is an activator, so they can bind only to dimeric form, not tetrameric form. So they really, uh, they really show the level of uh, dimeric form of PKM2. So I think it is very good tracer for evaluating tumor progression and yeah, proliferation. As looking at the brain image, it seems because of the background, it might be. Uh, uh, like 
interesting pharmaceutical for brain tumor evaluation, but uh, for other solid cancers, what might be the difference between FDG PET and this DASA tracer? And would, what if there is a discrepancy, what is what might be the reason for such discrepancy? Uh, discrepancy? Uh, actually, I thought it is very similar to FDG PET. At first of all, yeah, I understand what you mean. Yeah. The discrepancy mean, yeah, because uh, it shows because the tracer, I think that the trace two tracers shows the different level of uh, glucose glycolytic metabolic pathway. Uh, because FDT is just an analog of glucose. Yeah, actually, yeah, you mean is uh, increased. Uh, FTH accumulation means increased glycolysis in tumor. However, uh, it is not exactly the same uh, between uh, increased uh, glucose transporter and uh, PKM2 activation. Actually, I uh, will discuss uh, this discrepancy uh, this, this, this discrepancy in the part two because it is, I think, explain. <laughs> I think explain it's a tumor plasticity, tumor metabolic plasticity. But anyway, yeah, yeah, you you are right. Yeah, so, uh, but yeah, but if uh, but I think it is really not really, but yeah, relatively similar pattern to Thank you. I, just the one thing I uh, did not uh, understand was about the post-therapy scan. What is the purpose of doing post-therapy post scan at six days later? It seems not to be as a response, but it is very early uh, response. So what? is the clinical implication of this PET imaging, like right after the therapy? Uh, uh, yeah, I think it's uh, very important to evaluate the uh, function of chemotherapy in patient because, yeah, uh, the signaling pathway is very uh, reactive to cancer agent. So, uh, yeah, it, six days uh, a little bit, you may think it is very early period after treatment. However, but the signaling pathway, uh, it is good time to uh, show function of the uh, uh, metabolic change in cancer cells, I think. So, yeah. Thank you very much. Did you mention about uh, pyruvate kinase M1? Uh, actually, in this time, I don't did not deal with pyruvate kinase M1 because it is not specific for PK, uh, cancer. But I understand what you mean. You mean in the how they really How they relate to M1, M2? Uh, actually, in this time, uh, I have, uh, it is hard to answer about your question because uh, yeah, here is the relationship shows in the gene expression level PKM1 and PKM2, but uh, but usually PKM1 is uh, expressed in the normal brain or normal muscle tissues, and also they have only tetramorphic form with high kinase activity, so they don't have any uh, dimorphic form showing uh, oncogenic properties or non glycolytic properties like uh, PKM2. 
So yeah. Uh, but what what is your point about the relationship KM one and KM two? I think Professor Kim is muted. Yeah. Or I think we can have some 10 minute break and then uh, have some move on to the part two and have some more discussion after the uh, end of the lecture. Okay, then uh, let's have a 10 minute break. So see you 10 minutes later. Okay, yeah, see you. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, yeah, okay. Um, yeah, part two is uh, drug crisis induced drug resistance. Uh, yeah, actually, I think uh, the title is very grand, but uh, just in this time, I'd like to say or discuss uh, the relationship between drug crisis induced drug resistance and uh, in the um, glycolytic enzymes and also the cancer therapeutics. So, uh, I will uh, first I will uh, talk about the glycolysis related enzymes in chemotherapy and lactate metabolism in cancer and the uh, metabolic plasticity of tumor cells. Yeah. So. Uh, chemo resistance uh, can be manifested through various mechanisms, including um, alteration, um, alteration of increased drug efflux and decreased drug delivery, and also alteration uh, in the target proteins, and apoptosis suppression and enhanced DNA damage repair epithelial mesenchymal transition and epigenetic alteration, such as DNA maturation, and also several kinds of cell signaling changing, and finally, apparent metabolism. Also, several new studies um, disclose that mitochondria metabolism uh, in part drives a chemo resistance in cancer. So uh, I will discuss that subject in the end of this part. And anyway, yeah, drug resistance uh, occurs combined with this kind of a several process. So it is very complicated process. So at first, I um, would like to say uh, the relationship of uh, between drug crisis related enzymes and chemotherapy. Yeah, again, drug crisis, so let's review it again. So there are several key uh, enzymes in the glycolytic pathway, mm -hmm. uh, such as hexokinase and uh, yeah, phosphobactokinase and anolase and yeah, lactate dehydrogenase and also pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. So these are is very good targets for inhibiting a tumor. So it is very uh, yeah, it is very useful target for the cancer treatment option. So yeah, there are several candidate drugs for the inhibition of the glucose metabolism. The mostly studied um, inhibitor 
the most least, yeah, studied uh, target for elevation of a crisis is glucose transporter one. Yeah, it is natural because it is the first part of glycolysis. It is a gate. So there are several kinds of inhibitors, uh, including chemokines and antibodies and polyphenols. And also another inhibitors targeting hexokinase 2 and uh, uh, phosphobactokinase and pyrokinase and also lactate dehydrogenase. So here is a list of glycolytic inhibitors uh, targeting transporters and key enzymes in the glycolytic metabolic pathways. Some of these inhibitors are directly targeting uh, glycolytic pathway in cancer cell. And some of these inhibitors are uh, uh, resensitizing, uh, focusing on resensitizing of cancer cells to in the to chemical therapeutics uh, in the situation in chemo resistance. So, uh, yeah, a uh, half of these inhibitors are related to lactate metabolic pathway. Um, here, uh, lactate dehydrogenase and. Uh, MCT1 means monocarboxyl transporter 1. Actually, it is a major transporter for lactate, uh, efflux of lactate to tumor microenvironment. So they are, most of they are focusing in the reduce, reducing the resistance or the um, sensitizing of chemotherapy in several kinds of cancer cells. So that means our uh, lactate metabolic pathway is highly uh, related to development of chemo resistance in cancer. Also, uh, several glycolytic inhibitors are using in a combination therapy with uh, chemotherapeutics. Metformin here, uh, it is very famous um, inhibitors to inhibitors for targeting pyrokinase M2. So it is well known in the combination therapy with cisplatin. And also uh, curcumin is uh, maybe familiar with you, uh, it is targeting hexokinase 2. So it is well studied in the usefulness of combination therapy with doxtaxa in the several kinds of cancer. Uh, so this is um, example data showing uh, the role of metformin in the combination therapy with cisplatin in osteosarcoma. So here uh, you can see the change in the tumor volume in the several groups after treatment metformin and cisplatin and the combination group. Yeah, as you expected, the combination group uh, showed a very uh, big decrease in the tumor size uh, after treatment. And yeah, here yeah, you can see the, the very small tumor size compared to the other groups. And also the PKM2 expression level was decreased in the combination group. Uh, it is because of metformin, uh, which is targeting thyroid kinase M2. So in the group, metformin around uh, PKM2 expression was also decreased. And in the proliferative assay using thymidin uptake, the combination group shows a significant decrease rate compared, compared to the other groups. Actually, they used um, the PKM2 vector for positive control. So yeah, you can see in the combination group with PKM2 vector uh, was not uh, inhibited the proliferative ratio after three months. So that means it 
uh, it is it was uh, it was uh, occurred by the role of uh, metformin uh, inhibiting PKM2. And also in apoptotic assay, the combination group uh, showed increased apoptotic portion of cells yeah, here, so a high apoptotic rate. And in the assay of a uh, test space, which is a uh, a pathogen pathway related to caspase also uh, showed an increased level of the, the combination groups. So from uh, this data, yeah, we can understand in this combination therapy uh, induce a uh, decrease in the cell proliferation and increase in the apoptotic level. Uh, this is the another uh, research for evaluating uh, the relationship and glycolytic enzymes and tumor resistance. Yeah, they used uh, human colon cancer cell lines and uh, the resistant cell line to, uh, to 5 f So in the a state of expression of several kind of glycolytic enzymes. And you can see increased level of uh, glycolytic enzymes express a level in the colon cancer cell lines with uh, resistance. So here, prime kinase M2 and gap GH and the, the analyte. And also, they evaluated the serum PKM2 level in colon cancer patient. So it was divided by the response to chemotherapy and complete response, partial response, and stable disease and progression disease. Actually, the serum pyruvate kinase M2 was not significantly uh, different between two groups and the response group at um, stable disease group and progression group here. Uh, it, I think it, it, it's a natural result um, as I explained about the significance of um, pyruvate uh, kinase M2 phosphorylation. So um, this experiment, they just compared to a uh, level of uh, pyruvate kinase M2 in serum. So, yeah, this result is um, yeah, reasonable, I think. And yeah, in the tumor tissue, the uh, left panel shows um, the tissue from the patient in progression. So yeah, there are diffuse PKM2 expression in whole cells. And the right panel shows the um, tissue from patient and um, partial response. So yeah, they showed a little uh, PKM to expression in the tumor cell. Uh, anyway, yeah, this uh, study showed um, the relationship in the microbiotic like, enzymes, um, especially PKM2 and the tumor uh, chemotherapy resistance. So next we are discussing about lactate. Actually, uh, in past, lactate is just a voice metabolite uh, of gray crisis. Uh, glucose uh, is taken up by it is taken up by a cell where it is changed into pyruvate, and then pyruvate can then be used. Uh, by citric acid to make energy, or uh, it can be converted to lactate and released from the cell. So at this time, yeah, people thought lactate is just a waste of uh, the end of a uh, gray crisis. However, now uh, many scientists have reported and insisted uh, the lactate 
is not just the waste. Actually, they are according uh, as an energy source in the cancer cells and for cancer associated stroma cells. So they have tumor survival and proliferation. Yeah, so yeah, lactate is not metabolic waste product. Actually, most of lactate uh, produced in the cell uh, efflux, uh, efflux to the tumor microenvironment. It makes the tumor microenvironment more acid. So this change uh, can make uh, many kinds of immune related cells be uh, weakening. So it induces immune suppression in tumor microenvironment. And also this change, this acidic change in tumor microenvironment uh, help to uh, metastasis of tumors and also degradation of extracellular matrix. Finally, it, uh, uh, it helps yeah, tumor survival and metastasis. And also lactate can be incorporated into the cyclic acid cycle in mitochondria. So it can be a source of energy. And so it, it, it uh, provides uh, useful energy in the cancer cell itself in, and also other cancer cells. So uh, it has a tumor proliferation. And lactate, even uh, at, even uh, act as an oncometabolite with signaling properties. So finally, it uh, it induces tumor progression and invasion and metastasis, and also it participates in drug resistance. Yeah, here is very. Uh, complicated figure uh, showing the load of lactate in the cytoplasm of cancer cells and also tumor microenvironment. The major roles of lactate uh, is performed in tumor microenvironment because most of lactate are uh, going out uh, going out to uh, so yeah, here lactate uh, controls several kind of factors related to tumor development, like angiogenesis and metastasis. And also, yeah, lactate can control of several kind of immune cells. So they uh, inhibit the regulated T cells, and of course, they. Uh, can be an energy source of a cancer uh, associated macrophage. So uh, finally, it helps, uh, they make the tumor microenvironment uh, very useful to cancer cells. Yeah, so this figure is a summary of lactate uh, loads in the tumor microenvironment. Lactate acts as a metabolic fuel, uh, driving metabolic crosstalks involving MCT-related um, MCT related lactate shuttle among cancer cells or between cancer and stroma cells. So they are proliferated, they can proliferate in uh, cancer cells and also several kind of cancer associated cells. In addition, pyruvate acts as signaling oncometabolite, uh, activated signaling pathway, or um, as an extracellular ligand -like of the lactate receptor. Ultimately, all uh, cancer aggressiveness features are promoted, such as from proliferation and migration invasion, and extracellular matrix degradation and angiogenesis, and immunological escape, and yeah, final resistance to therapy. 
So those many scientists are uh, interested in targeting the lactate metabolism for cancer therapeutics. So yeah, there are several targeting inhibitors. Uh, there are several inhibitors targeting uh, lactate dehydrogenase, also uh, lactate transport from CT1 or 2. So the most classical and famous um, molecule is AT101 here. Actually, it is a nature product from cotton grass. So it, it is this of human lactate dehydrogenase A and B. And also recently, uh, selective inhibitors of lactate dehydrogenase B was developed. And also there are new drugs targeting uh, lactate transporter MCT1, uh, AGD3965. Actually, the, this tracer uh, is on the clinical trial. Uh, yeah, this is the uh, study uh, reporting the effect of uh, lactate inhibitors uh, using uh, at one zero one uh, in the patient with uh, acetate resistant prostate cancer. So in this study, uh, they showed of uh, uh, about forty percent patient. Uh, this drug uh, induced a decrease in tumor size, uh, sorry, in PSA level. And also the other study uh, performed in the expansive state small cell lung cancer. Uh, however, in this study, the results are not uh, promising the over survivor and time to progression free survivor uh, were not good in all patient. So yeah, now this uh, agent is uh, not so attractive. And yes, yeah, third one is uh, there is also association between like crisis and immune drug resistance. Uh, actually, I can, uh, I can guess you easily understand uh, the reason why there is a relationship between grad crisis and immune drug resistance. In the previous slide, uh, you have already, already uh, learned the metabolic product of grad crisis. Lactate is a highly, uh, highly controlled, uh, lactate can control the tumor microenvironment, including um, several immune cells. So yeah, it is a natural consequence yeah, based on that uh, lactate metabolic pathway. So it is uh, data showing the relationship uh, glycolysis crisis related genes and the uh, immune therapy resistance. Uh, this is a, uh, this study was performed in the patient samples with, with melanoma or non-small cell lung cancer who, uh, with uh, poor T cell infiltration. So yeah, it's a, Red star signal means a uh, high uh, T star infiltration of tumor score, and blue down means a uh, low T star infiltration score. So yeah, that blue means it, there was not good uh, immune uh, immunologic action. So yeah, here is many kinds of uh, glycolytic. Uh, enzymes are highly related to uh, tumor infiltrated uh, T-cell score. So uh, that means um, in aerobic crisis is uh, related to control of T 
practice of infiltration in tumor microenvironment. Uh, also, figure B, they also compare the two group between T cell inflamed and not inflamed of T cell in tumor. So it, this result is consistent with the figure A. So several uh, drug binding enzymes, uh, NRAs, gap DH, and phosphoblock kinase showed and differences between two groups. So yeah, this data uh, proved that there is a, a big correlation between glycolytic related enzymes and uh, uh, immune drug resistance. Uh, lastly, uh, I would like to talk about the transition of glycolysis to oxidative phosphorylation in drug resistance. Uh, actually, I think you may think uh, this title is a little bit weird uh, because uh, about until now, we are talking about the importance of glycolysis in tumor. But suddenly I uh, tell you the transition of glycolysis to oxidative phosphorylation in drug resistance. Uh, actually, several tumor cells have been uh, reported to have metabolic plasticity, indicating a transformation uh, from glycolysis to mitochondrial oxidative phosphorylation. So it leads to the production of vast amounts of energy and finally resistance to drugs. Um, yeah, so I'd like to say in oxidative phosphorylation can affect the treatment of tumors in several ways. At first, uh, the production of a large amount of ATP is the result of oxidative phosphorylation. Maybe you can remember the result. Uh, it can make 36 ATP per one glucose molecule. So uh, because of the large amount of ATP, uh, it can be stimulated the activity of some transporters such as ATP binding cassette transporter. Actually, if this ATP this C transporter is a target uh, drug efflux, so it can lead to the outflow of outflow of uh, several uh, chemotherapeutics and the induction of an anti-drug resistance phenotype. And second, uh, oxidative phosphorylation can stimulate tumor stem cell to expand. That means they can induce intratumoral heterogeneity, so it can confer resistance to tumor cells. So, yeah, now these days, uh, many scientists are focusing this plasticity of plasticity of cancer cells. So, uh, actually, I think it's very, it is very amazing. Yeah, I think. Cancer cell is very clever and they have very good adaptability. So yeah, this is a summary of part two. Uh, glycolysis related enzymes contribute to chemotherapy resistance in cancer cell. So there are many kinds of candidate drugs for the inhibition of glycolysis related proteins in several types of cancer. Also, lactate. Lactate is not only a secondary product of cellular metabolic waste of tumor cells, but also a key molecule involved in carcinogenesis as well as in tumor immune invasion and also uh, drug resistance. So now, possible targets of lactate production in cancer treatment are discussing. And Finally, glycolysis can be moderately transformed into oxidative phosphorylation when uh, the external environment changes or 
there is plenty of oxygen around the tumor cells or in the situation of chemotherapy. So we now we should we should know we should understand the, the uh, cancer cells metabolic plasticity so they can convert anytime anywhere from dry crisis to excessive phosphorylation or excessive phosphorylation to dry crisis okay yeah this is the end of part two so yeah uh please yeah, comment and uh, question there be any questions or comments? Uh, I think it's actually the part one is so complicated and it's not so interested. <laughs> so yeah. Uh, Professor uh, Edmund, Kim, do you, do you have some comments for us uh, regarding the issue? Uh, okay, if there is no further uh, questions or comments i think we can uh end the lecture for today now and thanks again for professor soyong kang for the wonderful lecture thank you very much okay thank you very much for your attention